everyone. Welcome to alpha carbon chemistry or enolates, covering slides one through eight. This chapter is sort of putting everything we've learned into a different context. There's no new mechanisms in this chapter, um, but we are focusing on some really important chemistry. So thus far, what is the most important bond making reaction for an organic chemist to be able to accomplish? say they're, that they're making a compound like the lava statin shown below. What have I told you guys is the hardest, most challenging, but most important to an organic chemist bond making process? Well, if you answered carbon-carbon bonds, you would be correct. These are hard to make, right? Because carbon isn't necessarily electronegative, nor is it very electropositive. And as we've seen throughout the semester, when atoms come together, one of them needs to be charged or partially charged in one way and the other one in the other. So plus and minuses go together. So how do we make two pretty neutral atoms come together? So we've seen a few ways of doing this so far. So what do we need in order to accomplish this? Well, we need one carbon to be positive, or partially positive and we need the other carbon to be negative or partially negative negative. and so far if you take a look at this chart I've got down here the way to make the carbon po uh, positive or partially positive is to use alkyl halides something with a good leaving group because the X group is electronegative making the carbon partially positive so that's one way we've made carbon partially positive. You put an electronegative group on it, that's a good leaving group. The other carbon electrophile we've been using is the carbonyl. Strong dipole, carbon is partially positive. So we've been attacking that carbon with partially negative or negative atoms. The last one, which I'm gonna mention but we won't use in this chapter, are the epoxides. This is where you have two partially positive carbons and depending upon substitution patterns and which mechanism you're using, you attack one over the other. But this is really the three methods we've shown throughout the semester for how to make carbon partially positive, how to make carbon an electrophile. All right, how have we made carbon a nucleophile, made it negative? Well, we've used them as strong carbon minus sources, when we have turned them into, say, a salt with magnesium halide, right, the Grignard, or its cousin, RLI, another salt. Basically, you're making an ionic system where the counter ion is a metal, so you're actually forming a salt where the carbon is negative. So Grignards and Alkyl lithiums are one way to make carbon minus. Another way that we've seen is to take an alkyne, and because of the sp nature of the orbital, we can actually add a base, a strong base, and deprotonate it. And we really only are able to do this realistically with alkynes because of the sp orbital. You can't just deprotonate an alkane or an alkene. The pKa of those systems are not uh, acidic enough. The most recent carbon minus that we've used is the ilid. So we were able to use triphenylphosphine and make an ilid. And we saw that those made new carbon-carbon bonds with ketones and aldehydes because of their resonance. Phosphorus is positive, but more importantly, the carbon is minus. So those are three ways to make carbon minus, and coupled with our three ways to make carbon plus, we, you, you may feel like, wow, I have a lot of flashcards, I've done a lot of chemistry, but yet we haven't really done a ton of carbon-carbon bond formations. I could add down here pericyclic reactions, which neither fall under electrophilic or nucleophilic per se, because it depends on the diene and the dienophile, 
But you could write down Diels-Alder chemistry is a type of, it's a very important type of carbon-carbon bond formation. But we really haven't, in the grand scheme of things, learned a ton of reactions that form new bonds with carbon. So we're going to add, this is what this chapter is about, we're going to add a very important tool in our toolbox. It's called the enolate. I'm going to draw it right down here. And this is what we're going to spend our time talking about. This is our new one. And enolate chemistry is, uh, serves a, it's very important. It serves a big role in the um, industry of making carbon skeleton frameworks. And you can see lavastatin here sold by Merck on the left-hand side. This is a statin drug used to help lower cholesterol and triglycerides for people with high blood pressures and heart disease. And I just want you to notice um, the six-membered ring here. You could, although it's tough because of the um, substitution patterns, but you, know, you could think maybe we could use Diels-Alder chemistry to form some of those six-membered rings. But we could also, with the stereochemistry involved, we could also consider using enolate chemistry. So we'll get back to that. Alpha carbon chemistry, or enolate chemistry, I've already sort of alluded to the name alpha carbon. The alpha carbon, what is that? Well, just like we have names like allylic and vanillic, we now have terms like alpha and beta, and these relate to specifically carbonyls. So if I was dealing with um, a double bond, I would say that the position right next to the double bond is allylic. If I had a double bond and I was talking about the position right on the double bond, and again, this is a carbon-carbon double bond, I would say that that is vanillic. When I'm dealing with a carbonyl, one position over from the carbonyl is called alpha and two positions over from the carbonyl is called beta. So just like allylic and vanillic, we have alpha and beta, but alpha and beta are reserved solely for when you're talking about a carbonyl. Now, making an enolate is simply just acid-base chemistry. And we'll talk about selectivities and how we're gonna control this as we move along in this chapter. But the long and short of it is, we're going to remove a hydrogen at the alpha carbon. So these are called alpha hydrogens or alpha protons. Technically, if you relate it to allylic and vanillic, remember allylic, the position next door to, was always the one that was more acidic or um, where the leaving group would leave, why? Because if a charge formed at that position, you would have stabilization through resonance. So nothing's really changed here. We're just gonna call it the alpha proton, which is kind of like a glorified allylic position. And let's push the electrons into the atom. What's the negative charge left behind? Okay, there's my anion. Why is this anion stable? Well, relating it to allylic, it's stabilized by resonance. So let's draw that resonance structure. Of these two resonance structures, which resonance hybrid is more prevalent? Right between these two resonance structures, which resonance structure is more prevalent? The one I circled is the way we draw an enolate. It's like an enol, but it's deprotonated. And the reason why we draw the enolate in this form and not with the negative charge on the carbon is because if you have a negative charge and you have a, a choice in placing the excess electron density on one of the atoms, would you rather place the negative charge on a carbon or on an oxygen? 
Use ARIO to think about who is more stable. If you looked at the atoms, you'd say oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, therefore oxygen can bear the charge so much better, right? It's like what we considered when we were looking at stabilizing negative charges. Who's more electronegative? Well, from left to right, oxygen is. So this is how we write an enolate. Let's talk about the bases that we can use to actually afford these enolates. The bases most commonly used are LDA, or a methoxide or sodium ethoxide salt, okay? I'm gonna list these here right now. You're probably wondering what the heck is LDA. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about it in a subsequent slide. Let's now look at where the alpha protons stack up relative to other protons. So how acidic is that alpha proton? Well, let's start with water. Water is, what's the pKa of water? 15.7, right? Now let's take a look at proton types as we go from an alkane to an alkene to an alkyne to an alcohol even. So recall that taking off the proton on an alkane is really difficult to do, thus its pKa is 55. Taking off a vinyl proton is also very difficult, 44. Once we get to the alkyne, now we're well within the range of possibilities, which is why we placed deprotonating them into our uh, toolkit in the previous slide. We were able to use bases to deprotonate alkynes, but not the others, because the pKa for an alkyne is 25. An alcohol is in a range just above water, somewhere between 16 and 18. So how does the alpha position stack up? So if you have a ketone or an aldehyde, how does the alpha position, say of a ketone, what's the pKa, how does it stack up? Well, it's around 19. What I want you to remember way back when we were doing alkene chem or sorry, alkyne chemistry, and you guys, after the addition of water, would form an enol, we would talk about tautomerization. The enol proton, so if you were comparing the pKa's of the proton at the alpha position to the enol proton, the enol proton is like negative, I don't know, five, negative seven. Now remember. Equilibrium always shifts towards the weaker acid. Always shifts towards the weaker acid. And the weaker acid is by far the ketone. Thus, let's get rid of this arrow tautomerization actually shifts way over to the ketone side. That's why enols never last long, because they get deprotonated and collapsed to their ketone form. This, this form has the uh, most acidic proton at pKa19, so that's way more stable than negative 7. There are some interesting cases, though, where an enol in certain situations is not so drastically shifted in one direction. In fact, sometimes the enol is actually favored over the ketone form. So here's an example to the right here. Technically, the enol over the ketone is favored, if you look at the equilibrium arrows I just drew. Why do you think that is? Well, if you guessed that the system on the left is aromatic and the system on the right is non-aromatic, you'd be correct. So aromaticity to form an enol is actually way more favored. So it's going to lie heavily, if not solely, on the aromatic side. The one at the bottom 
is more of a 50-50. It doesn't really, it doesn't really um, favor one way more than the other. They each have their pros and cons. The one on the left is great because you've got two things working for it. You've got intramolecular hydrogen bonding interactions and you have conjugation. Right? You've got these, you've got the pi bond and the pi bond right next to each other like a diene and they're conjugated and that means resonance and that means stability. Over on the other side, you, you don't have that acidic proton, right? So you have no conjugation, but at least you don't have that acidic proton. So this system, you find an equilibrium. So if you buy a bottle of, one, of, of the diketone, you're going to run an IR on it. You'll actually see some OH peak in the IR because it's in an equilibrium with itself. Okay. Enols are the cousins of enolates, and I wanted to mention that under highly acidic conditions, enols can form, but they still favor their keto counterpart. That's why we're not going to use them per se in this chapter, but I just wanted you to understand that enols and enolates are related. But as I mentioned, enols tautomerize due to their acidic nature. So how do we form an enol? Well, the carbonyl it's protonated, activating the carbonyl, and then the conjugate base, the HSO4 minus, deprotonates, and we can cascade our electrons up. To form the enol. But as you'll see from my arrow pushing, even though enols can exist, they don't exist in large quantities in the equilibrium due to their acidic proton, and they favor the keto form, hence tautomerization. What is a little bit more helpful to us and what we have more control over is enolate chemistry. And I already showed you, but I'll show you again, the mechanism for taking a base grabbing the proton and I'll show you the quick cascade up just like I did above to get us directly to the enolate. And the enolate is what we're going to be using. Okay, so this is our focus. I mentioned that the base that we use uh, most commonly in these reactions are either NaOET, a salt that you guys have seen multiple times, and also LDA. So I'm going to show you two things about these. Sodium ethoxide, you guys already know what this is, right? Sodium ion, oxygen minus. If I had, if I had a ketone, the reason why when we were running, when we had ketones and we were trying to make acetals, we would always do it under acidic conditions with like methanol so that we could get an acetal. The reason why we didn't use the basic catalysis version of it is because it's much harder to control. Why? Because the base, yes, the base could do an in, up, down, out, but it will collapse and give us the ketone again. However, under basic conditions, we, we actually compete with deprotonating the alpha position. That's why the acetal was always done under acidic conditions, because we didn't want to compete by deprotonating the alpha position. Now that we're in the enol, enolate chapter, we understand that yeah, sure, the OME could attack as a nucleophile, but we, we know that being a base, because it's so much easier to pluck off a little less hindered proton, which is a little bit more electropositive than a carbon, is so much easier to do. So this strong nucleophile slash base has competition. So that's why we were always using acidic catalysis in the ketone aldehyde chapter to form acetals. Now we're banking on NaOET behaving like a base, okay? LDA 
is another strong base and whoops it is lithium di isopropyl amide so it's a nitrogen that's negatively charged with two groups and they're diisopropyl groups. This is a very strong base. The nitrogen negative is extremely strong. It's way stronger than the sodium um, ethoxide or methoxide. It's very strong. And what else do you notice about it? What do you think those diisopropyl groups are doing? It's also very bulky. So it really cuts the competition of acting as a nucleophile and it really wants to be a base. So we're really directing it to be a base. Sometimes you'll see other bases used like sodium hydride or sodium uh, hydroxide, but they're not as common because they're not as strong and they're um, usually done in aqueous media and half the time your, your molecules are not even soluble in water. So we're gonna stick, I'm gonna stick to sodium methoxide or methoxide and LDA. The bottom line is enolates, if you can add a base, a strong base like one of these guys to an alpha situation, you have a useful carbon nucleophile. Okay, we have a new carbon nucleophile. You deprotonate it and the carbon is nucleophilic. Okay, so let's go over a general reaction. Here's the trend, okay? Number one, we're gonna make the enolate using acid-base chemistry. This makes some strong nucleophile, right? Our nucleophile is going to be strong because there's going to be a formal negative charge. We're doing acid-base chemistry to get there. So here I wrote AB, right, in the flashcard, because the first thing you're going to do to your ketone aldehyde ester is deprotonate at the alpha position to make your enolate. Next, what are we going to react it with, right? We, we need to take that negative system and react it with a weak partial positive. So you identify your electrophile for, a react, for the reaction. Lastly, I recommend numbering your carbons. These systems get very hairy and they're not difficult. They just get long, like the molecules become kind of big. So I really want you to number your carbons. Here are the general trends we're going to be looking at. We are going to make an enolate and react it with an alkyl halide. So we're gonna be doing acid-base chemistry to generate the enolate and then, I don't know, do an SN2 on a primary halogen, like propyl bromide. Or I'm gonna acid-base chemistry to make the enolate, and then I'm gonna introduce a carbonyl. What kind of mechanisms do we see with carbonyls? Well, we see one, two additions. So we're just going to practice doing this type of combination. Although you can use um, epoxides, uh, we're not going to use this one. This is possible. You can make an enolate with acid-base chemistry and react with an epoxide, but we're not going to do that one in this chapter. So let's begin with our first reaction. Let's take a ketone, react it with sodium methoxide, step 1a, and form our enolate. It kind of reminds me of like SN1, right? This is like the base version of SN1. Remember in SN1, you had to make the leaving group leave and form a formal positive charge. And then you could continue with nucleophilic attack. We never had that under 
basic conditions where you didn't have a strong nucleophile, so you had to make one. Now we're in this type of position where it's like the first step is actually to make the strong negative charge. Now we have our enolate. And what I want to remind you of is that although we write an enolate like this, I want you to be aware that it's the alpha carbon that is also negative, right, through resonance. That carbon is negative. So I want you to be aware that it's going to be the carbon that does the attacking. This is all about carbon-carbon chemistry. Despite writing an enolate with the oxygen having the negative charge, the carbon is the most nucleophilic site. Why? It's not as greedy. It might be written like this for stabilization, but the atom most likely to use its negative charge is going to be the carbon. It's less greedy. It's more willing to use that lone pair. So remember that. We write the enolate, but now in step 1b, let's introduce that propyl bromide I talked about. We're going to do, so this first step was acid-base chemistry. Second step, because I have an alkyl halide, we're going to do an SN2. We're going to bring the electrons down to reform the carbonyl. And the pi bond is going to attack in an SN2 fashion from the back. I'm going to label these 1, 2, and 3, 4, 5, and 6. 1, 2, now double bonded to the oxygen. 3, that's the carbon that did the attacking on 4, 5, 6. Bromine got kicked off. Remember, you still have sodium hanging around. Whoops. You still have sodium hanging around. So the salt just goes away into the water layer. And that's it. I'll let you practice this one below. Let's try and enolate with a carbonyl. Notice that this has a named reaction. Yeah, that's because we're making a new carbon-carbon bond, everybody, right? It's the secret to a Nobel Prize. So let's start with, I don't know, an aldehyde in this case. Let's use LDA. I'm just going to use um, LDA. We're going to take off, don't be fooled, an aldehyde, that is not an alpha hydrogen. Alpha hydrogens lie on alpha carbons. There's an alpha carbon, there's an alpha hydrogen. This is not an alpha hydrogen. Be very, 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 very aware of that, okay? You need to have the hydrogen on the carbon itself. Because remember, if you take that hydrogen off, the carbonyl carbon would be negative, and the carbonyl carbon's positive. So, oh, that, that would be bad. We want it to be at the allylic position, not the vinyl position. So we're making the enolate. Acid-base chemistry. I've got my enolate, my strong nucleophile. I, I remind myself that it's the alpha carbon that's going to do all the heavy lifting with the, with the attacking. Now I just have to look for my electrophile and say, oh, I have, I'm actually just reacting it with another molecule of itself. Okay, I can do that. Introduce another molecule of itself. Let's number our atoms so that we don't get confused. Carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. So carbon 2, so once I collapse the system, carbon 2 is attacking carbon 3 and kicking the electrons up in a 1-2 addition. Let's draw that out. So we've got oxygen double bonded now to carbon 1. Carbon 1 is still attached by one bond to carbon 2. 
Carbon two is my alpha carbon, which attacked carbon three. And carbon three is now single bonded to oxygen who gained electrons minus. And carbon three is still connected to carbon four. I don't have to draw that extra hydrogen in because it's no longer an aldehyde. At this point, I assume a workup because look, the negative charge cannot come back down. There's nothing but carbons and hydrogens off of carbon three. So I just work it up. And this is an aldol reaction. An aldol reaction, an aldol addition. Okay, not terrible. The first step is the new step, and it really is just acid-base chemistry, and then we do either SN2 or 1,2 addition. All right, one more. We're gonna do an aldol condensation. Now notice the difference here. I'm adding one more mechanistic step. Why E2? Well, since I'm under strongly basic conditions, I'm gonna add some heat and drive it forward to something that's a little bit more stable. Without the heat, we stop. Notice that I didn't write heat. and This is all the same stuff. This is the same reaction in a sense, except I didn't have heat here. I'm not driving the reaction forward irreversibly. Here, I'm adding heat. So let's take a look at this. Let's do the same reaction. I'm gonna change the base up to sodium methoxide. Okay, so the first step, we typically run these in thermodynamic conditions with weaker bases, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. First step, make your enolate. So I'm gonna deprotonate using acid-base chemistry. And make the enolate. There's my enolate, reminding myself that it's the alpha carbon that's gonna do all of the, the attacking. I find the electrophile. Oh, it's another molecule of itself. This is repeating the same reaction we just did. I'm gonna number my atoms, one, two, three, and four. And then I'm gonna push the electrons in a one, two addition because I'm reacting it with a carbonyl. Collapsing the enolate, making carbon two attack carbon three and kicking the electrons up in an in-up reaction. One, two, addition. So we've got carbon one, which is now double bonded to the oxygen. Carbon two, which did all the attacking. Carbon two is now connected to carbon three, which now has a single bond to the O minus, and it still is connected to carbon four. Now I've got reaction conditions that are a little bit more protic now. There's some, because I deprotonated here, I have some methanol floating around, and the heat is what's gonna allow the second step. So now I'm in my E2 phase. Let's do some acid-base chemistry. Let's just protonate under these conditions to get the alcohol. At this point, we're at the aldol product, the aldol reaction product, but the heat is going to help us drive this irreversibly in a very productive direction. Remember, we still have base around. Okay, we have base around, we're under basic conditions. We still have protons at the alpha position. So the heat is going to allow an E2 reaction. The negative charge is gonna act like a base and it's gonna go after, no surprise, it's gonna go after the alpha proton. But instead of forming the enolate, which it could do, but it's, it could reverse itself back out, instead, how about it does an elimination reaction, popping off OH minus. Now you might say, OH minus isn't a good leaving group, but we're already under strongly basic conditions, so it's actually okay. And there's a driving force for this. Look at what you've made in this last step, the E2 step. 
Under these conditions, you can, strongly uh, basic conditions, you can drive the reaction to eliminate the OH at the, at the beta position, the beta OH, through more acid-base chemistry at the alpha position. So you're gonna do an E2 in the opposite direction. This is a very stable product, why? Why is the aldol condensation product that we're looking at here more stable than the aldol addition product? Conjugation. It's like a diene, right? You have two pi bonds that are conjugated to one another, so there's resonance and much more stability. So heating this, this up under the basic conditions prior to workup will actually get you to this system. If you keep the conditions cool and don't have heat, and you just kind of throw in your acid at the end, you end up at the aldol addition product, which is actually what a lot of people do because they might want that alcohol there. It, either one is attainable, but you can drive it also a little bit further and harder if you heat up the system. Those are the three big reactions for this chapter. Really just introducing a new nucleophile to you, but doing the same SN2 or 1-2 additions and then finally an E2 if you drive it forward with heat. I'll let you guys practice those um, using some, uh, I added a little extra complexity, but named them. The book treats these as individual instances. Um, and so I want to give you guys the opportunity to see that it really isn't that complicated, despite having the book talk about, ooh, the crossed aldol condensation. That just means that you're not reacting it with itself. You have a system that you're making into the enolate, and you're introducing a different system for the 1-2 addition. That's called a crossed aldol. Mechanistically, it's exactly the same. Same thing with intramolecular aldol condensation. Poof, that's a mouthful. It's really no different. It just happens that the carbonyl you're making the enolate with is on the same species that of the carbonyl that you're interacting with as the electrophile. So, you know, number your system and follow the rules. You will get there.